Welcome everyone to the last fair shot of 2023, adopting open source in data science and AI across sectors case study series. I am Alexandra Araujo Alvarez, a research firm manager of the Turing Way. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a Latin American woman with freckled face, brown hair, wearing a striped black and white jumper. I am very excited to be here with you to speak more about this topic. To get us started, I will share a few words about the Turing Way project before passing the mic to Malvik and Rafael, who will be co-facilitating this conversation and then on to our speakers. For those of you joining for the first time, the Turing Way is an open source community that documents, maintains, and translates best practices in data science and AI. We are an open, we are an open collaboration whose goal is to make reproducible, ethical, and collaborative data science accessible and comprehensible for everyone. We aim to do this by creating resources, facilitating events, and stewarding community practices that bring perspectives from countries, backgrounds, disciplines, and lived experiences. The Turing Way is hosted, but not exclusive, to the, Turing, the Alan Turing Institute, the UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI. We have a code of conduct that applies to this event to ensure accessibility and respectful collaboration. If you experience or witness unacceptable behavior or have any other concerns, Please report it by contacting the project member to at the, the, Alan Turing, the, the Turing Way at gmail.com or to report any issue at this event involving one of the organizers. Please email one of the members individually, either Kirsty or Marvika, their emails are, are here or in the front of that. Um, please know that we will have a share from about that you should already have access to to facilitate written note taking and invite ideas from you. Uh, now I am delighted to hand it over to Marvika and Rafael to kick off today's session by introducing themselves before passing the, ma the mic to the experts in residence. Malvika, to you. Thank you so much, Ale. Um, I think it's very important that we kind of acknowledge when we talk about the Turing Way, all the people who have built it. So thanks all the people who are part of the community and also um, creating the book. When we worked across these different groups of people and uh, over the four or five years, we've also become aware that Working at the grassroots are important, but it's also important that we work with organizations directly, which is where we started to work towards scaling our impact um, by working with organizations directly, which is where the Turing Way practitioners have actually uh, came into the light. Here, we want to combine grassroots championing of best practices with systems level adoption and culture change. The Turing Way received funding from Bridge AI, uh, Innovate UK Bridge AI's mission is to help businesses in high growth potential sectors. So how high growth potential sectors could include organizations like agriculture, food processing, transportation, construction, warehousing, which already use data and can utilize AI to unlock their full potential. The Practitioners Hub was uh, primarily funded to build direct collaboration with organizations. And we brought together a group of experts and residents uh, who worked with us between June and December, who you'll be listening from today. So we have Lucy, Rowan, Steven, Vengia, Maxine, and Raphael, who used to be our expert in residence until last month. Vengia will be joining us slightly late because she works in a startup which has a low number of staff and we have to understand the different complexity that they face. Um, and today we are very excited to bring them all together uh, to talk about their experience. I'll be sharing the slides so you can go through it. Um, and with that, I'm very delighted to stop my screen and invite Rafael to introduce himself and will be co-facilitating the session with me. Thank you so much, Malvika, um, for the introduction to me speaking, but also just to have a meet for co-facilitating. Um, I feel like I've had a very lucky journey in that I was invited to be part of the Practitioners Hub and the inaugural hub um, during my time at Genomics England. And then even after I left, kind of, you were also kind of kind and supportive in that everything I learned really kind of will help me for me personally and individually and in my future work. Um, so I was really happy to kind of be invited here today. Um, you're going to hear kind of a lot more from the individual experts um, and everyone will talk kind of about their case studies and everything they're working on. Um, so I'm going to keep my introduction very brief. All I want to say is that, um, so I used to be part of Genomics England. I was working there as an open source manager. Uh, Maxine from Genomics England will give a bigger overview, over, overview to uh, what that means and what Genomics England does. But my role essentially, whilst I was working there, was to figure out 
how open source could apply to the work the team was doing and to see how we could develop an open source initiative to further um, equity in genomics modeling. And um, since kind of my time at Genomics England, I'm now working on my own startup called Ospo Now, um, which has been created to provide open source program offices as a virtual service to customers and clients from for-profit to non-profit sectors, understanding that open source has become a real need, but not everyone has the resources to implement it, which I do think should be a barrier for anyone. Um, and with that incredibly brief introduction, I really want to highlight instead our experts who are kind of still working and whatever they're doing. Um, so I'm going to start to pass it over to them. And the first expert um, I'd like to pass to is Lucy. And I'm going to ask everyone, first of all, to give kind of just very briefly, say who you are, what your affiliation is, and then we'll, we'll get into the first questions of the fireside chat. So Lucy, who are you and uh, what do you do? Hi, I'm Lucy. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a white brunette. Um, I work in the UK Polar Data Centre, which is hosted at the British Antarctic Survey. Um, so our work uh, focuses on polar research and also uh, supporting the operations of our polar bases and the Sir David Attenborough ship. Um, it's kind of an exciting time in polar and environmental research at the moment as things are becoming increasingly autonomous and we're able to apply AI and remote source sensing more and more. Um, this is highlighted in the case study that we produced as part of this project um, and we've had some uh, really cool um, projects in our AI lab um, which I'll be talking to you more about later. Thank you so much Lucy and Rowan over to you. Thank you um, so my name is Rowan Hemsey I'm a data scientist um, at the Office for National Statistics. Um, I've got brown hair, glasses and I'm wearing a uh, maroon and pink jumper. Um, so my case study um, was uh, designed to highlight um, um, highlight the the guidance that already exists, but also to sort of put a human face to some of that guidance, um, and to show how people at ONS are um, uh, creating open source um, software and pipelines, and are really keen to talk about it. Thank you, and we're very keen to hear about it as well. Um, Stephen, you next. Hi, um, I'm Stephen Haben, a senior um, data science consultant at the Energy Systems Catapult. Um, I've got blonde hair, ginger beard, glasses, and um, black shirt. Um, yeah, so uh, I work at the Energy Systems Catapult, and you know we we sort of sit between industry policy and uh, academia, and and we're there to support innovators and and help them. Uh, bring their innovations to markets and help support the move to net zero. Um, I'm in particular in the digital team, and we believe digitalization is a, is a core element of, of trying to help us get to net zero because we need to be monitoring things. We need to be sort of automating things and controlling devices to be able to make sure that we can utilize renewables to the full extent um, and help make sure we can support the, the energy system, really. Um, so I'll talk later, I guess, about my... my um, platform um, but that is what this uh, platform is is a collection of metadata on energy projects um, and we hope that that's a way we can help support the landscape and understand the needs of the landscape thanks thank you Stephen um, and last but definitely not least Maxine Thanks, Raf. Um, so, hi, my name is Maxine McIntosh. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I've got aspirationally open hair and I'm wearing a grubby but very cosy navy fleece. Um, so I work at Genomics England. I had the good fortune of working uh, with RAF. I'm going to say the privilege, either, either, even I'm going to embarrass you in front of everyone. Um, and so Genomics England uh, is a private company owned by government, which is, makes it a slightly unusual structure. Um, but we do two main things. We provide um, a lot of the back end to uh, something called the Genomic Medicine Service, which is the world's largest routine um, genetic testing service. And then for patients who consent to their data being used for research, that research from the NHS then goes into um, basically a big database that can be accessed. Um, I run a program called Diverse Data, which sits on that research side of things, which looks to improve um, the ancestral diversity, particularly of the data we have. Um, but above that, we've got a kind of equity agenda, which is how do we make genomic medicine as equitable as possible? Um, and so as part of that, um, we're doing lots of data generation activities, lots of community engagement. We're sending up new research programs, 
But the bit that's particularly relevant to the hub is that we wanted to focus on the practice that we have as individuals and um, the way that we work um, and the impact that has on the equity agenda when it comes to genomics and genomic data. Thanks so much, Maxine. And when uh, when Jay joins, we will ask for an introduction from them. But we will move on now to hear kind of more about your case studies. We've had some brief brief spoilers into what it might contain, but um, I'm going to kind of ask each you to talk for maybe two to three minutes and tell us about your case study. Maybe share some key insights and messages, and um, and also there's anything that really kind of surprised you or specifically stood out. We'd love to hear about that as well. Um, so I'm going to go through the same order again, and Lucy, that's starting with you. Yeah, so I think the case study kind of highlighted how um, we're kind of moving in environmental data from being quite good at sharing open data, um, but and moving now towards a more uh, kind of asset commons with other tools and code and software being shared more openly. Um, and one of the projects that we focused on in the case study was called IceNet, which does sea ice modeling, and they've created like a generate generalizable operational system um, using their software, research software engineers, um, which is now applied into other other systems such as forestry. So that's really cool. Um, and um, we also uh, focused on how open data practices had and could in the future um, kind of created some innovation within fields with enabling reuse of data sets um, and meaning that that um, the resources invested in getting that data set in the first place wasn't duplicated in the future. Um, and also how re reuse of data is really important for us as we try and influence environmental policy um, going forwards. I think also one of the cool things about BAS is that we're super interdisciplinary. We have scientists of all kinds of um, backgrounds um, at the forefront of their field working together and also so many other other skill sets working in our, our organization it really wouldn't be unusual to have a scientist working with an engineer working with a field guide working with a data manager and so a challenge but also an opportunity um, associated with that is just uh, trying to kind of unify all those different skill sets and um, backgrounds together to be able to collaborate most effectively um, so the Turing way is kind of vital everything that it represents makes make sure that that is a positive process um yeah so mm -hmm. um it's really great to hear about that i think it's really great also so early on to highlight just the need to kind of reuse things just to prevent resource duplication which happens constantly um which is such a good kind of use case for everything being open um Rowan, over to you tell us a bit about a case study and some key insights and messages. Thank you. Um, so as I said before, I'm um, from the Office for National Statistics, which is the UK's um, uh, National Statistical Institute. And it's also part of the, um, the UK civil service. Um, and there's a lot of guidance out there um, for us on how to do open source and why it matters. Um, for example, from the, um, from the analysis function, um, and also from the uh, Central Digital and Data Office. Um, so there's a lot of guidance out there um, on what people in the civil service should be doing. And um, there's also some guidance on- I was more like 120, 130 for um, There's also some guidance out there on how we should be doing it. Um, but it's also, these are all bits of official guidance and they're really useful. Um, but they're not as always, um, there's, people go to guidance when they know what they want advice on. Um, and so what I wanted to do with this case study is to try and get people who think this might be relevant, this might be interesting, but aren't bought in yet. Um, so won't go out there looking for guidance, um, but they might be in, like they're interested. Um, and so this, um, case study, it takes um, uh, three sort of, um, we're calling them open sources at ONS. Um, so three people who are doing open source um, and care about it and asking them why do they care about it? And also how, um, have they overcome the difficulties because it's really important and it's um and it's what we should all be doing but it's quite a difficult transition to move 
from um, never having heard of what open source means to um, doing it in your own work. Um, so we've asked three people at ONS how um, they've used it in their own work um, and um, what they'd like to share with people who are thinking about getting started. Um, so there's a couple of key things that I think um, they've shared that I'd like to share now. Um, and one of that, one of those is about um, the fact that in ONS we're wholly publicly funded. And so it's really important um, as a sort of as a civil service body that we are transparent and we share um, we share what we are doing um, and how we're doing it. And so I think that's a really important part for um, ONS in particular. Um, and also, um, I think another key takeaway um, is that it's not just a technical problem, um, that this is about, um, it's about people, it's about how we can build people's skills, um, and it's about how we can sort of change culture. Um, and that's not just a, um, yeah, that's just not not just a technical problem. It's a it's a people problem, and a, a people opportunity, I should say, not a people problem. But. Um, and I, th I think you mentioned again some fantastic points. I think even the phrase "just doing open source" is, is <laughs> such an open question. What does it even mean? Mm, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a bit of a problem. I think we need to get people again doing it a bit better. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's something we'll definitely be talking about today as well. So thank you so much, Rowan. Um, and next, uh, Stephen, kind of same to you, tell us a bit about your case study, some key insights and messages, or just anything that really kind of stood out to you. Sure, thank you. Uh, yeah, um, you know, I think first to mention is sort of the energy system has changed a lot in the last five, even 10 years, really, um, going from what was very much a supply-centric model. You know, energy was generated and was pushed down the transmission line and fed to consumers. Uh, whereas now it's become much more de decentralized. Um, and I think that's driven a lot of digitalization. And I think it's dr driven where open source can be really important now. You know, we've got smart meters in, well, we tr attempt to have smart meters in every home, right? Uh, that we understand people's energy usage um, and also where there are opportunities. Um, so there's a lot of projects now uh, and the, the spirit of openness is kind of uh, spreading a bit more through energy and energy research. Um, to try and support those things. Um, our platform uh, we've de developed is called sort of the catalog of projects on energy data. I, I maybe wish it was called uh, projects on energy metadata because it's really about the about the data on the projects themselves. Um, and it was funded through Energy Rev through the in Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund. Uh, and the idea is to collect public uh, projects together, um, how they've been funded. Um, you know, and the aim of the platform is essentially to sort of understand the funding landscape, um, also understand who's been involved in them, the organizations, the people, and maybe also visualize that, look where funding is, or maybe look where funding has been sort of allocated un unfairly or unevenly as well, and maybe where other opportunities exist. Um, and we think it's quite important because, um, as mentioned uh, before by Lucy, you know, um, about you know reducing duplication of effort as well, making sure we can uh, efficiently allocate resources and aiding reproducibility where it's needed, especially in data sets where it's just sparse, uh, and hopefully also driving innovation um, and maybe even getting people to work together. Uh, we wrote in the case study a few of our kind of uh, findings or understandings from from putting this case study together really actually helped us sort of um, really focus on our learnings there and. Um, you know, I think one thing was really key was that openness had to be th thought about from the start of when we were developing this. You can't really put it in later um, or you will struggle at least to put it in later. Uh, it was really key for us that we sort of designed it with, you know, um, a device, div diverse set of end users in mind. Uh, you know, what did, you know, what did 95 percent of the people who may use this actually want to do with it? You know, it's no point in us thinking this is the most important thing. It's got to be clear. Um it was also important that we built a, a, an inclusive, active community. You know, I think it was really key that we had a concerted effort engaging with those who would be using it, but also getting many eyes on it to see where the issues were. Um, and also, you know, it was important. It started off as a Coventry University project and we took it on. 
uh, you know, and it's very difficult sometimes where a study starts as academic for it to have ongoing support. And it was really key that Energy Systems Capital was involved in that. Um, and then, yeah, the last bit really was just about the basics, really, sometimes, which can completely uh, um, make it difficult to then uh, use it, which is sort of getting things like licensing correct, um, making sure that those things were were built in from from as early as we could and understanding how we could share what data because then you can design it around that and make sure people feel confident using what you've put out. So, um, yeah, I think that's just a bit of an overview of what we've, what we've learned through doing the case study itself. Thank you so much. I think it's probably fair to say that kind of all those things in mind with accessibility, diversity, users and things you're really kind of heading towards like how open source makes things equitable and how it's a really an active process by design. And that's, I think it's just really great to hear. Um, and finally, Maxine, I mean, I've, I've had a sneak preview of this case study. I've worked on it with you, um, but tell everyone else all about this case study and key insights, messages and things that just stood out to you. Yeah, so um, I guess the the case study on one hand uh, focused on a project that um, we, I guess, piloted over a sort of 18 month period called Link23, but then also brought in a broader conversation across gel. When I say gel, I mean Genomics England. It means Genomics England Limited. So when I say gel, I mean Genomics England. Um, and it brought in a broader conversation about um, what does open and open practice and open source and open science mean, mean at gel. Um, so focusing on the specific project, um, it was a project called Link23, which is about ensuring that the users, beneficiaries of the tools that we're building, the solutions we're developing in genomics are as diverse as possible to ensure their application are as equitable as possible. So that involved um, creating a community of people who are um, advocates and fanatics and enthusiasts for equity in genomic medicine. It involved um, curating existing tools that could be applied to make your work more equitable as a practitioner. <laughs> Um, a practitioner here could be a clinician, it could be a researcher, it could be a patient. Um, it also involves scoping potential challenges to work on. These challenges could be all over the world. They could be um, in Singapore, in the Sudan, in Sudan, it could be in the UK, wherever it might be. But a problem that lends itself well to maybe an international group of uh, community working on the problem. And so bringing all these components together um, to uh, understand and develop to what extent we could make um, the approaches that we use in genomics as equitable as possible. Um, in putting the case studies together, a number of different colleagues, including myself, were interviewed and discussed. And it was interesting kind of seeing the, the breadth of opinions and perspectives on what openness meant. And so I think the case study really highlighted that, you know, we uh, do provide a clinically accredited pipeline. Um, there are lots of things that we can't be open about, um, um, but there are many things about that which lend themselves very well to um, open ways of working and the use of, in this case, um, standards for these accredited pipelines. But also brought in other topics like um, our ethics um, director at Genomics England talking about um, openness being a way to make research more accessible by creating publicly accessible blogs in lay summaries so patients on whose data you've done some analysis can actually understand what research has happened. Um, Genomics England does have a pretty major open source uh, tool called Panel App, which um, we've been developing for many, many years and is kind of our flagship open source product. Um, and so even though it, it's within the organization, the kind of feeling and culture, going back to a previous comment, isn't really there yet about open ways of working. And there's still quite a lot of, um, I guess, concern and fear and, and risk felt around um, lots of open ways of working. Um, and I think probably the last kind of takeaway from the case study was that um, when I joined the program, um, like many people will be aware on this call, you kind of, you, you, you get given a bid that was written by an amazing person who probably knows lots about policy, but maybe not lots about your domain. And there was lots of work within there that was focusing on the need to collect more data and the need to work with communities. Um, but there wasn't a lot around changing practice and changing the way people work. And so for the Diverse Data Initiative, um, this is a huge thing that we really want to focus on is that it's all well and good having really, really rich and diverse and representative data sets. And it's really great having lots and lots of relationships. But if no one's willing to change the way they work, then there's no kind of channel to impact to make your work as, as equitable as possible. And so for us, that's a real, um, I guess, vector by which we can hopefully have positive influence as a program. And yeah, we, we found the Turing Way was um, very important and inspirational for us because um, as a government sort of owned organization um, that has a certain risk appetite. Um, it was interesting to be able to look at, to a, you know, not identical, but similar organization going through their own journey on open source and open science um, and the kind of hurdles um, and challenges that they overcame um, was really, really useful for us to be able to say, look, those guys have done it. Like, let's have a go and roll our sleeves up too. Thank you, Maxine. And like, just to 
have echoed that point in the end. I think I spent quite a few hours online, offline, having coffees, meeting people at the showroom just to really understand how, how you were doing what you were doing. So um, just a personal thanks to kind of everyone whose who's ears I talked off for the past few months whilst part of a practitioner's hub. So um, Maxine's actually kind of nicely taken us on to kind of the next question I wanted to explore with all of you. Um, and a few of you have kind of mentioned, like, maybe we'll call them problems, maybe we'll call them opportunities. Um, but I think one of the things that kind of we often think about when it comes to open source, um, but also more generally about data science or kind of you know, buzzwords around kind of AI is, it's great to say these things, but that doesn't mean it's easy to implement them. So I want to kind of throw a question open to all of our experts on the call. Um, please raise your virtual hand um, if you have something you'd like to contribute. But really kind of what I want to think about is what are setbacks organizations should be prepared to face when implementing open source practices in their projects? So if you can get them to that point where kind of they're ready to, to try out open source, what might go wrong? And maybe even tell us why that might be okay, why that might be a learning opportunity. So let's not just focus on the pitfalls, but also the real opportunities. Um, so I'll give you a moment to think, and then I want to see some virtual hands up um, and uh, I want to hear your thoughts. Maxine, straight up, go for it. Um, I'll, I'll start because I'm going to dovetail on a point that I started making. And um, so I think for us, it was really a, um, I guess, almost philosophical clash in a perception of risk. Um, so I think in government, appropriately, there is, these are public funds, there is a very strict and high bar for risk. Um, and I think that's absolutely what, 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 what in, in, in theory, um, that's absolutely what you want your government to behave in, in, in that sort of way. But what I do think that that creates is an environment of lots and lots of ways to mitigate known risks and to prevent the kind of uh, serendipity or the uh, opportunity that actually opening things allows, which is a lot of often new opportunities the other wouldn't have seen or new people who weren't involved to come in or exponential growth in something. All of those things are amazing byproducts of working more openly, um, but they do open you up to a potentially unknown and or massive risk. And I think that that, going back to previous, is such a cultural difference um, because actually you end up debating the risk of not doing something is potentially bigger than doing something. But that's a very, very difficult thing to articulate when actually the medium by which a lot of these programs and this work operates is through comprehensive risk registers that are managed in quite quite sort of narrow ways, in my opinion. Um, so I think that's, for me, the, the big one for, for government and government adjacent organizations. Um, and maybe a slightly smaller one, and because all the hands have gone up, so I've bought everyone some time to say much more profound points. But I think there is something around uh, that, which I didn't realize, because when, you, when the, you're in the bowels of the community, you, you forget the sort of pattern that you have that's very, it's a motif of the way that people like you work. And I, I definitely had a bit of a reminder when I exposed um, some of the kind of open source community to colleagues, quite how niche and specific the way we communicate is, and actually that... For many people, you know, it seemed a little bit like sort of technological anarchists um, just raiding the internet with the way that we worked and communicated. And I think just realizing what a kind of quite specific community this is. And so for many people, just accessing that way of working and that way of communicating and understanding was kind of interesting. That I didn't quite realize in itself would be such a big barrier to it. Thank you, Maxine. I think that raises kind of a really good point about how, how the open source community is seen externally. Um, and mm. I, I'm going to ask you a quick follow-up. I was muted the whole time. No, 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 no. You, um, you said follow-up question and then you oh, muted yourself. Right. <laughs> I was going to ask a follow-up question, which you kind of already answered, um, which was basically, I just wanted to kind of hear about how you would help kind of people in maybe more corporate structures be more exposed to the open source community. But I think kind of you accidentally said straight away, you, you just did that, you just said, here are some examples and here's how they work. Here's how they talk. Um, and I, I think exposure probably is, is the right is the right thing to do. Um, lots of hands up. Stephen, you, you were next. So over to you. Hi. Um, I'm not sure how insightful, but I'll, I'll stick to my best. Um, I guess uh, we could talk from our experience. I mean, we're a bit lucky in the sense that we, you know, we have part, uh, we're sort of part government funded organization who has time to maybe uh you know get things right before we we launch things so um i think there's that advantage so it's very difficult to sometimes extrapolate those and i think it's very difficult to um to look at sort of monetizing open source obviously in some cases and, and how to do that um 
and they don't have a huge amount of information on that. But I think for for us, um, I think there was a long lead time in getting something ready in our case. Um, you know, and even though the data we were utilizing in this is open, I think it was surprising for us how tricky that could be to get the data in the right um, the right way and also deal with the other issues, which, you know, the, the people providing the data aren't necessarily thinking about the use case that we're doing with it. So I think um, engaging with them is something probably I wish we'd done earlier to understand, you know, um, to, you know, to make sure that we got things in the right way and the right structure. Um, so that's kind of the first thing was sort of doing more homework, I guess, um, uh, than we, we, although we did do a lot of homework. Um, I think the other thing is there's a lot of work to keep developing that. Seems to be a bit of a diminishing return uh, when we, we get to a certain point. There's a lot more work to sort of add further features um, and things like that. And I think maybe that's something to be prepared for. Um, and then I think getting people to use it, it's not easy to sort of just release it and hope people will use your 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 stuff. I think you've got to really actively engage people show them what they can do with it show them the value um you know and, and understand you know what what you're offering that and you know in some cases there's a lot of products out there doing similar things you know if you're looking at things like energy system modeling there's a lot of those things how do you really stand out from that crowd and to, to put you a little bit on the spot and maxine i see you you have a response there but it seemed like it's a very quick follow-up to that which is do you have any examples of how you did manage to get people to use that software that you guys developed? It was really going door to door in some ways, you know, for us, you know, I think because also you realize even if you create something with value, um, you know, people get used to, to dealing without it as well, you know, so therefore it's not even necessarily in your, your radar that you could find a product, you know, if you're, you're used to doing some things in a certain way, you know, you don't always you know, uh, look for the value you can get, you know. Um, so I think that's that's one thing is just just you've got to really just demonstrate it. And it is, is you know, in some ways, I think we are, you know, we're still we're still getting there as well. But maybe it's about getting to a certain critical um, mass as well. Uh, before I pass on to the next topic, Maxine, if you had a response. Yeah, just a quick um, add on to something that Stephen said, which is around um a, a different approach that we took that um which, who knows which was the right right one but about um carefully um building something and developing it and then releasing it um we i took an approach which was sort of quite quickly show show people the future otherwise we're going to spend a lot of time trying to paint people a picture of what something could be and actually sometimes it's quite useful just to sh show show it so one of the things that i did is i just decided to launch soft launch link 23 you know, show the tent, people came into the tent and people got excited about being in the tent. And by that point, the horse had kind of bolted, which meant that Gel sort of had to had to deal with it and had to be open to it. Um, it's not clear whether that was one of the reasons why uh, the, the project was kind of was, um, stopped. But um, I actually think that without having forced people to see what the potential was, I'd probably still be making the case for why this isn't even uh, potentially a good idea. So it's kind of interesting to say whether you want to just, you know, launch lightly and see what happens or build the case carefully and which is the better outcome. I don't know which the answer is, but we took a different strategy. We will be uh, a bit later asking questions about kind of metrics and evaluation. So I think we can return to this topic quite soon actually. Um, but Rowan, over to you. Thank you. Um, so I um, wanted to come in with a, um, I think I'm in a similar sort of situation to Maxine um, at the Office of National Statistics. Um, in that we have a lot of sort of quite sensitive data. And um, as Maxime was saying as well, it, rightly so, um, there's a lot of um, sort of the biggest priority for our organisation is that that data is, is safe and that we're um, protecting sort of the public. Um, and in that, people think that in order to keep the data safe, they have to keep everything else sort of hidden. And I think that's one of the things that came out from, from all of the um, interviewees in our case study, in that that's actually not the case, that you can, there's a lot you can share whilst protecting the data privacy. And um, and actually, um, the idea of sort of security by obscurity um, is, is a bit, um, <laughs> there's a lot of debate around it. 
and it's not necessarily the best way to go. Um, but in order to um, to open source safely, um, when you have um, such sensitive data, um, you really need to have people with the skills. And I think that would be something that I would want to say to people who are starting this is think about the skills. Um, um, yeah, um, <laughs> that was a from to pull up a quote from the case study. Um, if I could wave my magic wand, I'd give analysts the ability to use the open source tools. Um, but we can't. We don't have that magic wand, unfortunately. So um, I think that would be something I would say to people. Thank you. I would love to catch up in X years time once you, you have complete freedom to use all open source tools and see how the ONS has transformed. Um, Lucy, you had a hand up, but it's gone back down. Um, we'll give you the opportunity if you if you want to say anything. Yeah, sorry. Um, I was just going to say I I really appreciate what Maxime was saying about showing people the future to demonstrate value. So I think the biggest challenge that we face as an organisation is probably a cultural one, and a lot of that comes down to where credit is placed um, is that I think people are scared that if they make their tool open um, that they've lost the opportunity to use it and because the way that we currently measure research is driven by publications they are potentially damaging their own career or their own organization's opportunities um, by giving away that tool and so changing that mindset is the hardest thing and I think that that the way that we do that is um, by valuing a greater range of tools rather than just publications and a greater range of people, which is what the Turing Way has um, demonstrated to me the most. That's definitely been one of my biggest takeaways. So going forward, that's what I'm going to try and bring back to Bass for sure. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. That's really great to hear. And on that um, topic, I think segues very nicely. And now we're going to hand over to you. Thank you. Um, I I have to like tell a little bit of background for the folks that the experts in here were recommended from their organizations and they are already recognized within their organization as advocates for open science and they've been providing mentoring, training, advocating for open science. So Practitioners Hub was mainly a space to bring them all together and get them to, you know, relate on similar challenges that they have and how they can build the sustainable practices in their organization. One of the biggest elephant is very much what Lucy was saying, is that a lot of the work that people do are either not recognized or maybe not visible externally and definitely do not fit the traditional metric system when we are assessing success for a project or product or an organization. Um, and we've had conversations around metrics and measurement. And this is the question to, as a nod to that. How do you all measure com and communicate the impact of your open science work? Um, and how can we use the Turing Way and the Practitioners Hub to build a shared understanding for communicating in a similar way across different sectors? And I'll start with Rowan this time. Uh, thanks for putting me on the spot there. Um, uh, so I think this is a really difficult question and um, I don't think we have the answer at the moment, but we have started to do some work to try and get part of the way there. And um, I say we, because uh, a lot of this work has been done by colleagues and former colleagues of mine. Um, so please don't assign it all to me. Um, so, um, we, a lot of um, work at ONS has done to try and work out, um, for example, like time savings or cost savings um, when we're talking about transformation work. Um, and there are, there's a lot of important sort of data there and that's really helpful. And it is really important that we're providing sort of value for money for the taxpayer. Um, but that's really hard to capture um, sort of savings like that when we're talking about open sourcing. Um, but there are a couple of things that we do that can help us try and evaluate um, this sort of work. Um, so one thing that we've done to try and <laughs> try and get some numbers is um, we have an annual coding and analysis and research survey. Um, so that asks um, people at ONS, but also um, across other um, 
government and public sector organisations um, to ask answer some questions on um, their ability to code. Um, but also um, it asks them about some good coding practices, for example, using open source software and writing open source software. Um, so we do have some numbers over the last few years on those sorts of um, questions. And um, we're still analyzing the data for 2023, but um, 2022, um, the most, um, more than half of the people we asked um, said they use open source software, um, but about 10% said they write it themselves. And I think that's really difficult because people clearly see the value in the work that other people have done, but they don't seem to be doing it themselves. Um, so yeah, it would be nice to see that number go up. And that's something that we can keep track of. Um, uh, but our um, our survey seems to be taken by, um, we don't have a sort of a, a nice random sample. Um, so it's hard for us to extrapolate um, a, from our survey respondents to people in general. Um, but something else that we've tried to do as well is some um, qualitative work rather than just trying to get numbers. Um, um, so we try and do also a yearly exercise where we interview um, people who are involved in this sort of work. Um, so this year we've asked our community um, what they need. Um, and that's been the focus of our uh, qualitative research. Um, and so what would help them to adopt these practices more in their own work and what sort of um, what sort of community support they need. Um, and by that we can also access case studies and we can make sure that we're um, providing um, the right sort of um, information. And um, yeah, if we get, if we notice that we're getting more requests for more um, advanced, more sort of complex topics and case studies at our um, network and community events. I think that's also a good sign that people are advancing, um, but that's not necessarily the case. It's, again, all of these things are difficult to measure. Um, in one of my chat with Steve, we were definitely talking about that often these kind of studies will have biased data, but you have to start somewhere. It's better than not having done that. So I really appreciate that you're combining both quantitative and qualitative data. Steve, would you have something to share on this? Yeah, um, I guess, you know, same, same as Ron was saying there, it's very difficult to do. Um, you know, uh, we've you know, we, we track our own impact because we have reporting to do as well ourselves as a catapult, um, you know, and it's usually things, you know, you can track readership, um, sort of downloads of data and code and patents if, the, if there's any created. and But they're obviously sort of almost just inferences um, based on, the you know, the impacts that are made. And it's, you know, there's always confounders there. So it's very difficult for us and it's always something we're really interested in. So, you know, whether there's anything through the Turing way, which could support this, I think we'd be really interested. Um, we sort of, you know, I think if there are ways of tracking them, often they are also barriers to sort of the open source a little bit. So there's a bit of a um, conflict between sort of making everything open and then sort of putting in some degree of tracking. Um, but but I guess similar to what Rome was mentioning, we sort of do do surveys and and try to talk to those um, who you know we're we're making impact with or hope we are making impact with. Um, and I think that seems to be one of the core ways we can do it. But I think that's trickier when you think about the fact that um, you know the innovation that we're doing isn't something that's necessarily going to be implemented in the next five years or even ten years. So you have to look sort of longer term ahead. Um, you know, to understand whether there was any impact on that. And it's a very difficult thing to do. I'm going to pose this question to Raphael, um, knowing that you've been doing this kind of work across different organizations, 
and now you're going to step into your own organization. Um, what, what would you share around measuring the impact of these kind of work? Uh, and I imagine this would be something that would be part of your portfolio too. Yeah, so I think I want to say the wrong answer. No, I'm going to say the right answer and then I'm going to say the wrong answer. Um, so what I think the right answer is the things that you can tell people that, that you can quantify in normally qualitative ways. So there's a great group called Chaos who develop metrics primarily for community health and measuring things around like software development. So they have uh, basically a list of metrics, what we now call metric models, which are groups of metrics, uh, which all related to a topic. Um, and where Chaos is really great is that it's almost too easy to like buy stars on GitHub. Like there are literally websites you can go to where someone can just like star your repository. Um, but where it gets harder to do is start when you measure more kind of complex interactions, like the number of like downloads after a given event or the acceleration of progress or the time it takes to review a pull request or an issue. So there's lots of this really interesting ways that you can measure how people are interacting with your project. Um, and I, I'm definitely a believer that a happy community would generally mean a thriving project. And I think like I, I always, I'm not saying it now, like I always say the Turing way is my go-to example for this. Like when you see this sort of event and when you see this sort of engagement and excitement, it's not surprising that kind of, you know, the online book is, it's not going anywhere anytime soon because people are just so engaged. Um, the issue with purely community health is that everyone here has a manager who wants to see some real numbers. They want to know what does community help actually translate to. Um, so this is why I want to give kind of what I think is now the wrong answer. Um, I spent the past few months uh, you know, going into a startup. I have to think a lot now about uh, metrics for myself and think about how do I govern success? If I'm telling people to you know, use open source and consulting these various ideas, how, do, how can I say to them, you know, you, you've increased X, Y, Z, like over the profit margin or whatever. Um, and one thing I was very hesitant about you know, this time last year was equating open source with money. I think often people think open source, you develop some software, it's free to use, and that's where the discussion really ends. But actually, there are lots of ways of making money from open source, whether it's subscription services or software as a service or kind of whatever it may be. And often these are ways in which you can kind of sell it back to a company. Um, you can actually go back and say, we can develop this incredible open source piece of software, but actually you can also make money from it. You can also use open source software to avoid having to use proprietary software. More people should use open street maps, not Google maps. There's lots of alternatives that people can really get behind and engage with. And that can be fun and it can be rewarding and it can help companies with the bottom line as well. Um, so that's my <laughs> happy open source positive answer, but also my little bit more cynical one, which I'm trying to more actively engage with um, so that I don't completely crash out within six months of starting a company. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I, I suppose there is also this element for what do you as an organization or a project care about and, and how do you align it with your existing framework or something what Maxine, you were saying, how do we embed EDI in our work, which is an organizational framework rather than just open science. Um, I'll come back to you, Maxine. Just want to give a shout out to Benjia, who's just joined us. She's one of our experts in residence and we'll take some time to introduce her. But Maxine, please do respond to that. Yes, yeah, so this dovetails on a conversation that, that you know I had Malvika, which is around also making some of this work more visible because then everyone thinks it's something that can be tracked. So Jerl does a, an inordinate, inordinate amount of planning across the organization. We're a matrix organization, so it's like whack-a-mole on getting all the pods to work together. Um, but we use OKRs, objectives and key results, which many of you might be familiar with. Um, and a lot of it is surfacing invisible work or work that you know is required to make things more open in those sorts of planning environments because then it sort of gets elevated in people's awareness which then means that when you start measuring it or at least making the work more visible that it can be captured um it's it's more it's seen as as, as a reasonable and chunky piece of work um, and i do everything from putting that in quite concrete organizational planning activities to um helping our comms team draft tweets so that when we release a blog about an analysis there's a specific bit in the tweet that says, and the code is is available at the bottom of the blog, which is, you know, in some respects quite small, but it just means that people who might not have even considered it just see it a bit more in the work that they do. 
Um, but yeah, also just adding, it's the quality and quantitative. The, one of the good things about open source is the numbers can get pretty big pretty quickly in terms of activity. And so that's a really important thing to capture because activity is it, is quite impressive as well. But in when combined with deep case studies that capture a real culture and color and texture to all of the impact and the outcomes, um, those things in my experience have worked most effectively hand in hand. Thank you so much, um, Vinjia. I want to give you a couple of minutes to introduce yourself. Uh, we, we we are in the middle of our discussion, and we still have a couple of more questions to go where you would be responding. But we would love to hear a little bit about who you are, and maybe if you could share one highlight from the case studies that we have built. Okay, so I probably have met some of you in the audience before, but maybe not all. So just for those of you who haven't. Um, we haven't got a chance to 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 talk. Uh, I'm Winja Tan, and I'm the head of data at Digiho, and apologize for the late joining of the call. And it was something, some meeting that I really couldn't, um, I couldn't get rid of. Sorry, I apologize. Um, so um, so I've been engaging with Malvik and the you know other four um residents um here over the past almost half a year and it was a very pleasant experience to actually get to know each other and understand you know people's remit and i'm working in a company that is really late adoption of the ai technologies and there are a lot of really inspiring conversations that we had um over the past few months to actually let me realize that actually i'm not alone <laughs> there are a lot of things that we share and lots of things that we are frustrated with. And, but you know, I'm sure that together we will find a way to move this forward. It just needs a lot of collaboration, participation in this program like this. Thanks, Vinjia. Raphael, back to you. Thank you, Malika. Um, and appreciate the break of my voice. So, um, yeah, so one of, the, one of the things that came up um, during the practitioners hub that um, I think a few people kind of mentioned every every now and again, but it was good timing because it was also being mentioned all over the world was um, AI. And I don't want to focus necessarily just on AI, but really kind of these thorny issues in data science as they come through. Um, and one question I wanted to think about for everyone um, were really about kind of the opportunities. So what are the opportunities for kind of high growth potential sectors or areas of work within other sectors where AI adoption is slow or yet to happen. Um, again, it doesn't have to be AI, like really want to think about kind of the, the potential for data, uh, for data science. Um, and in terms of this, what I really want to, us to go into is what can open source practices bring to them? So where we find adoption slow, where we want to drive change, how can we be using open source as a method to um, kind of sell these ideas? Um, and there's a few people I'm going to want to pick on to, to answer this. Um, I'm going to start with Lucy, if you don't mind. Hi, yeah. Um, I feel like I have, um, Bass has an interesting perspective with this just because um, some of our research is amazing at updating AI and is just naturally good for AI adoption and some of it less so. Um, so in some of the traditionally less computational areas, we've still got high growth potential. And I think um, possibly one of the barriers for this is just that uh, individual researchers feel like they're lacking the skills in order to implement it um, and I think the natural way we might recommend adopting AI in that case is to contract someone to help them um, or to collaborate with someone um, uh, but I think actually possibly the more successful way to or the more sustainable way to go about it in conjunction that, with that is to invest more in early career um, data practitioners or researchers um, because they can combine a kind of natural further skills kind of technical skill set with um, the discipline knowledge that they already have and um, that's something that I've learned specifically from our wildlife from space project which we have at Bass where um, there's they invested in postdocs and PhD students who were both wildlife biologists and computer scientists and they kind of brought their expertise and taught um, their seniors um, which was really really cool and so I think that's a way that some of our um, um, areas for growth um, in AI could really um, expand in the future and um, I think we've done really well at adopting um, 
AI to replace some manual work in like image classification already, but there's still quite a lot of manual work associated with lab work and field work um, that we could invest more in. So, yeah. Thanks, Lucy. I think one, one of the areas that you mentioned is really cool about upskilling. Like you, you invest in student to keep senior people, which is fantastic, but I've definitely seen that backfire, especially people come from maybe more academic space. So I'd be really curious to know kind of what, what worked, like how, how was that, how did you respond to that? And, and you know, how did you manage, how did you pull it off? I, I think it, I guess it's like the institutional buy-in and everybody's so excited about that project um, that the, they had the resources behind them and um, that's what that's what worked for them. But I, they obviously didn't do it alone. They also collaborated with um, some computer scientists um, from other organisations, which really helped propel it forwards. But I just think that the project would have ended or wouldn't have been so, so successful if they hadn't had that approach. Great. Thanks so much. Um, Wenjie, if I can go to you next. Um, same, same question to you. Well, I would say that it really depends on the context of the work that we provide to people. So, for example, in our in our uh, company, a lot of the work are manual, and uh, you know if you are just looking at improve the efficiency by whatever means, probably sometimes it's not that interesting to data scientists because a lot of the work is so basic that. Even macro in Excel could actually enhance the operational efficiency massively. But really depending on how you contextualize, context, contextualize that work. So for example, one particular work that I'm very keen to, to do at this moment is to really use the uh, generative AI to help enhance the data quality. Um, so for example, in one of our very, very kind of painstaking um, work, is we have to have people manual check whatever whatever the input for weight of a shipment. So we are doing the you no know, road transportation business, and currently there is a huge wave, or you know, the, the from government from everywhere for the carbon emission reporting and you know reduce carbon. So one of the critical elements for that is how how heavy is the vehicle or how heavy is the shipment. Those sounds basic, but if you look at the process chain, there are so many areas or so many points that people can input wrong because there's no guard rear in the traditional, very manual process. So why one of my, you know, kind of the reason that we were engaging here is, you know, I'm just wondering whether any of my team can actually look into this generative AI to say, okay, if there's a weight information being input, there's a kind of notification comes up to say, well, you have input this, but typically with a vehicle this type from this customer on this route, it weighs here. So that is in line with the knowledge of what kind of good it was, what kind of vehicle type it was, and what kind of, you know, what industry the, ship, the, the, the customer is playing. So looks simple, looks straightforward. You can get the ops buy-in, and also from our perspective, from data perspective, this is definitely quite an interesting project that would get, get people excited about. So this is something that I think we, we, we will need to find some, you know, examples like this to entice people to make sure they're engaged, especially in the environment that overall data literacy is, is, is not up to speed, most of the cases. How would you actually get people engaged with you to 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 recognize and support your work, so that is one example. I hope that hopefully that that that, that, that makes sense to you. It makes a lot of sense. I think AI for, for, for process engagement, for managing inefficiencies, is, is a fantastic use case. And I think on the subject of very large data sets, where kind of AI processing can be of help, mm -hmm. um, I've seen. I wondered if you had anything to add in this case. You mean a process in large amount, large database, everything. Um, so one of the other areas that you know we are currently doing is looking at network optimization. So essentially, we have hundreds of thousands of shipments each year that for at least twenty percent of them are running empty. So we have uh, utilized some of the you no know, kind of processing or optimization algorithms 
to try to understand where the round trip can be created with all the constraints that we have. However, one area that we have not yet tapped into but will be really beneficial for the whole industry is we have the open, um, I'm going to say, we could potentially open our database if it is allowed, but on the subject to all the other um, organizations or, you know, companies also open their, their route or their, their shipments routes so that we can look at the huge um, one giant network rather than multiple ones in silo because if you look at the um all the customs in lateral a lot of overlaps that we have however people have been working in silos they didn't have visibility and it's not open because you no know, for various reasons commercial or technology uh, technical is is not yet there but if we can look at those, then we can potentially looking at, you know, all the latest technologies processing large or huge volume of data. That would be, you know, value adding for all of us, all of the participants. Thank you so much, Wendy. Okay. Um, Navika, we're going to pass back to you. Thanks, Ralph. I, I wanted to just pass this to Maxine um, to respond to that. No, you're okay. <laughs> I do have last two questions. Um, and this question, the first one, I actually wanted to get some personal recommendation from you all, from your participation in the Practitioners Hub. Um, what are some lessons learned? Um, what recommendation do you have for the future cohort um, or the organization that are not being part of the practitioners hub, but could potentially engage. So I would begin with you, Maxine, on this. Am I allowed to pass this to Raf? Because uh, Raf took took pass mostly in the practitioners hub. Um, uh, so can I can I be cheeky? Please do. Yeah, go ahead. Well, so, um, yeah, I mean, I think I will. I, I think I think kind of. What I became aware of kind of during the practitioners hub was that um, it was something which I think I started off in my first kind of few days that I, I literally just joined Lots of England. So my kind of my early thoughts were like, how do I figure out what is going on in the new company I've joined while simultaneously extracting something from the practitioners hub? And I think that actually was really useful because it meant, first of all, I could figure out things internally, but also it meant that I could really draw on the individual elements of the practitioners hub. And I think that wasn't is what enabled me to do kind of do the work I was doing at Genomic Engine. So kind of the, the journey I had really kind of took me from understanding that, um, and I remember we had this great kind of workshop um, in person at the Turing Monday that actually really helped with this, but it really kind of made me think about what does it mean to be an expert and kind of be comfortable with that word and how kind of, you know, once you can incorporate that maybe identity or, or what should I say, word, <laughs> into your day-to-day -day job, you can then kind of, you can do better kind of within your organization. You can take the skills that you've learned and you can apply them. Whereas I think I'd started my journey thinking, thinking about it from the other way around, which is how can I help my organization? What can I take from this for them? Not what, what can I take in it for me? So I think my kind of my recommendation is really kind of emphasizing that, that individual, really starting from that point, which is, you know, what, what do you need to learn? What do you need to get out of it? And then moving to how do you take this forward? How do you take this into your own organization? Um, and really having that as a focus. Thank you, Raf. Um, Lucy, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, what Raphael said. Um, I think at the start, I also I talked to Malvika about this before. Had huge imposter syndrome. So my re my recommendation to anyone doing the practitioners hub in general is to just embrace the parts of your own perspective that are different from everyone else's. Um, and that's yeah, that's useful for everyone. And also. Um, that you may come from a niche and therefore think that certain things aren't relevant for you within the practitioners hub or the Turing Way or Turing Institute, um, but just be open-minded and ask loads of questions because you'll be surprised what is relevant. <laughs> so when Gia was the only one representing the Bridge AI network or per se, you know, startup, so I'm also very interested hearing from you, Gia, if we engage with more startups going forward, what recommendation would you have for us engaging with them? Um, so I can only speak from my 
own experience because I know startup is quite wide or very, very vague definition of companies. You know, a startup in tech and a startup in traditional industry that could cover total different spectrums. So I can only speak from, from my spectrum, which is the traditional uh, industry startup. I think the reason that we have this startup is because people realize that incumbent currently in the traditional industry, if they are not disrupted, some people will disrupt them. Um, so that's why we have this kind of, you know, startup um, experimental um, try, try from the company to say, okay, if we introduce those new ideas, introduce the digitization, you know, introduce the data insights, can we do any better? So in this kind of, um, um, how to say, startup, I think the most important thing is to really to understand where they are, you know, kind of understand where the company is in their vision, in their journey. So right now, for example, what we are is really, really early stage. The company, so we, we, we are trying to, you know, digitize something that in another industry probably have been happening for almost a decade. Um, and also from the people side, people have quite polarized the view of AI because of not knowing AI enough. So it's like when you first encounter a new thing, you probably wouldn't have that sophisticated understanding of a new concept of a you know, new item. So people either think it's fantasy or think it's going to take that job. So with those in mind, engaging with um, startup, com startup companies in this industry probably needs to get buy-in from the um, at least the leadership team First of all, because otherwise the people would question what then what is the purpose? Because sometimes it don't sound so obvious for data people, some sound so obvious for you know for the community here. It probably just the message is probably is not there yet. So that is my kind of feeling. So I've got question, for example, that you know, then then what is the outcome of this? What are you trying to achieve? And this is something that I have to spend time to explain, to demonstrate, and and then by that time, I realized that, okay, actually, they haven't really got the concept, although <laughs> I thought some of them did. So this is the one thing that I would probably suggest that, you know, you probably need to spend a bit more time, more efforts to try to get buy-in, try to get, you know, those um, basic ideas and the message get across. Really appreciate those advice. Um speakers. Uh, Lucy and Steve, would you like to share something before we move on? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, for us, it's, um, you know, I really enjoyed, um, it, you know, this, just to say a bit more about the, the Practitioners Hub, which I think for us has really been, it's really nice to look at yourself and benchmark yourself. You very get few opportunities to really do this as well, um, to sort of see what your, um, uh, you know, do you that you're doing the right things and gives you confidence to move forward to this. So I think one thing this is has been really helpful for us actually has been um you know to make sure that we we can we're doing the right things, you know, you can't always know you're doing them, but also to make sure that you know we're finding new tools that we didn't maybe think about. You know, and some of them, you know, maybe are obvious tools, but actually those things are maybe the the hardest to get right as well. Yeah, correcting myself. Um, Rowan, I think the point that you made about benchmarking is I, I remember very vividly my conversation with Rowan is like, ah, oh, this is very uncomfortable when you start thinking yourself as a champion and expert. There's so much responsibility that comes with that loaded word. Rowan, any response to that? Um, yeah, I think that was something I've uh, found difficult over this. Um, this period is again, I think as Matthew was saying, it's quite and you, Lucy, as well. Being called an expert is is quite difficult. Um, but I think, yeah, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm not sure I have an answer to that because I'm not sure I've accepted it yet. Um, but I think something that I'd like to um say about this process was, I think the most valuable thing for me was getting to meet people from outside of the public sector or from um sort of not from a government organization because I get to speak to a lot of 
people from different government organizations. It was really interesting to see how this is being done in other sorts of organization and to see that whilst whilst the problem whilst we've all got di slightly different circumstances we're actually facing similar problems and um yeah uh, it's nice to see that you're not alone in facing those problems and hopefully we can continue to um try and communicate across sectors to how we're going to address them Right, I'm going to start wrapping up um, and skip one of the questions um, to save some time for an unrecorded part where our listeners can actually come online, can come on camera and talk to you all. So I would like for all of you to give us a closing statement, anything that you would like us to leave um, in general from the practitioners hub, but also from your own work as open science practitioners for many, many years. So um, I'm going to start with Lucy with this one. Um, yeah, I think I'd like to end on coming back to the point about accessibility and that um, for us, polar research is like traditionally super, it, it roots in um, rich white men going off to uncharted lands and um, to see all of uh, our data and tools um, being able to be used by institutions, people, countries, people with different skill sets that otherwise would never have access to these things is amazing. And I hope that that continues across everyone's sectors. Rowan? Thank you. Um, I think there's two things I'd like to say to finish up. One is um, just to invite again, people who were thinking that they can't do open source to um, consider why they're thinking that. And um, the other thing um, I'd like to say is actually um, about, about what open source actually means. Cause I think I came into this program thinking that the main aim was to get your code out there and to get your methods out there. And I think something that is really sort of struck to me is more about community and um, I think that's something that we're not as good at focusing on as, as data scientists is um, how can we communicate better with the people that want to use our work and how can we bring them into the process? Um, so that's what I'd like to focus on next is um, how can we get better at talking to our users and our community? Steve? Yeah, I guess the first point is there's loads of opportunities, I think, in the energy sector. Um, it's been a sector that's typically been cautious, I think, as you know, sees risk everywhere. Um, so I think now that I think as we've digitalized more of the energy system and, you know, this presumed open principle is, is sort of permeating the sector a lot more. Um, I think uh, there's a lot more openness to this. And I think there'll be a lot more opportunities, therefore, to, for open source to make some impact as well. So I think it's really important um the sort of work that's being done through the this this practitioners hub um but i think for us just from the case study i think specific learning i think was just to you know it was more than just making this thing open this platform it was really key that we sort of knew who our audience was you know knew what the value was and what they needed um you know so kind of releasing that code was the easiest part really um and we just had to be clear. We put some right documentation together, all the basics, really, in some ways uh, that sometimes aren't aren't thought about. So I think it was really clear, keen that we we did that, and and then we made it accessible. I think, as Ron mentioned, actually, it's you know, it's more than just making something open. It's actually making it accessible. You know, being really clear um, what what it's about, how you can learn more. You know, how you can you can really uh, make the most out of the platform. One thing that definitely came out from all of your uh, case studies, and you obviously weren't looking at each other's case studies as you were developing, none of you talked about open source as a major, major point. You all talked about working in the open as a major point, which was which was very reassuring about what, what uh, Rowan, you were saying. I'm going to ask the same question to Benjia, then Maxine. Well, okay, so I have to admit that I 
when I started this journey with you guys, I didn't think the open source is actually taking the front seat. It's definitely not the kind of um, the key point I was trying to achieve. But you know, I, so after a while, I just realized that actually, hang on a minute, open source could be setting up the example, setting up the standard, you know, give people the best practice if people have the aspiration to, to arrive there. So thinking about my um, my company, so we are trying to educate people about data. We're trying to educate people about how AI, you know, would influence their work. You know, the open source part, we, we, we probably can take this chance to demonstrate good examples, demonstrate what has been standardized and so that people understand a bit more. And that would really help with that training process and you know demystifying what open source and AI is. Because those that there are a, really a lot of the good material that we can leverage and use. And and also from the company wise, we are hungry for new innovations. You know, those ones would be we do, you don't know when would be a really good opportunity or good chance for us to actually start to engage with some part of it. So we are still kind of inspection, inspectioning, but it's, it's more around how to get the education up to speed with the help from the open source. Thank you, Venturia. Maxine. I've got kind of two that are not necessarily most important, but they're the top of mind. So one is that um, in order to get this work off the ground, especially in a sort of a naive organization or at least naive environment, is um, you need more than just a sponsor or senior person to um, advocate. It's not kind of good enough to passively support. You really need someone to break down all the hurdles in order to get these things over the line. And that is because all the structures around us are pushing us to behave in a certain way. And a lot of open science and open source and open ways of working is going against some of the grain. So having having a, a senior sponsor who's really advocating for it and bashing down those hurdles, I think, is 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 instrumental. And the other one is maybe it's because it's December and maybe it's because like I'm feeling kind of emo and a bit mellow and it's going to come across as very kumbaya. But there is something for me about there's so much joy that you can access by being in the open science and open source and open adjacent communities and not everyone has the most positive experiences but as someone who runs a couple of communities on the side of my day job being able to tap into people's endogenous motivation to want to work together to want to collaborate to have a space to be able to i guess you know manifest their slightly unusual ideas that maybe they can't do in their day job is such an amazing sparkle and fizz to work around and, and with and so if for nothing else i'm um, using uh, open source as a way to access more joy in your in your daily lives and your jobs is for me like an absolute win peace <laughs> christmas let's go all go on holiday we should just end there um <laughs> but i want to really hear from rafael your your uh, takeaway as well um I think, I think my takeaway is that uh, if I were to bet that every single person or every single company in the world would be using open source in some way within 10 years, I would. And I actually did because I quit my job and started an open source company that bets on that one idea. Like I, I think that everyone, whether they are releasing open source licensed code or using inner source, um, open source will be everywhere. And I think that initiatives like this that bring people together to talk about these issues, to work together, to get through these things and to discuss these things are just so important because like this, these are where kind of the big steps will happen. And kind of just, I've learned so much from everyone over the past few months, like hearing what you're doing, hearing the things you're tackling with, like knowing I haven't been alone in some of the things I've tackled um, has been incredible. So I just, I think my, for me, it's a desperate plea that the children kind of keep just doing this and that kind of the things that you learn and the case studies just keep getting shared because these will be increasingly more and more and more important. So I just want to thank you all for being part of this. I think one of my biggest hope from this place was exactly to make sure that all the lone champions can connect with each other and not be lonely anymore because sometimes advocacy work can be very lonely, very emotional. And I'm really glad now I want to invite Maxine to peace again and tell us that you know open science can bring joy and uh, bring people together what to expect in 2024 i would share the slide deck and i want I won't repeat that but i really want to encourage you to go please check out the case studies these are really wonderful stories that you can relate to you can bring back in your organization to advocate for the work that you all are doing 
Thank you all for joining us today. I'm going to stop recording and um, invite you all um, who are still here to come on camera and talk to our speakers. Thanks again, all the speakers. Thanks, Ali, for all the work you've done and all the folks who've joined us.